Hi. What an amazing crowd. Welcome. Give yourselves a hand. Another hand. Um, who, who drank the most glasses of Sophia Rose? How many? Three? Five? Right here? Six? We are so thrilled to have our guest, our special guest here tonight. I know you are because tickets for this event sold out like almost immediately. Um, so congratulations on making it in. Um, I'm not going to bore you with a long introduction because we'll talk about her work when she joins us and we sit here <coughs> together. So please join me in welcoming Sophia Coppola. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> After. <laughs> um, well, I, I wrote down a few questions. We're going to talk about uh, some photos that you brought along to share with the audience, and we'll get to those sort of in a moment. Um, I've got my notes here. Uh, our, you know, our audience today, as we mentioned, was sipping, sipping Sophia Rose. How That's cool her. is it to have your name? I on know. Rose? I felt lucky as a kid. My dad said he'd make me a champagne one day, and he. He kept his word. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Um, you know, John Waters has been on this stage not only for the 50th anniversary retrospective of his films a couple years ago, but um, he also sat here and interviewed Isabelle Huppert for us. Um, you were with him three days ago in Provincetown having a conversation. Uh, how did that go? How was that? Yeah, it was so exciting. I mean, he's so great and funny, and um, and it was it was. It was so fun to be honored by him and just to get to talk to him. It was, I, I loved and visit, visiting Provincetown. Sophia was honored as the Filmmaker on the Edge, the annual uh, honor that they give to a filmmaker each year. Uh, and I didn't realize until listening to the conversation that John is good friends with your mom. Yeah, and I was so curious how my mom and John Waters became buddies. <laughs> <laughs> my mom is, you know, she's kind of like soft-spoken like me, and I just wouldn't think of her being pals with John Waters. So um, they met through an artist friend of my mom's, um, uh, Lynn Hirschman. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure when, but I, I thought it was really fun to- She watched his early movies? I don't think so, but maybe I'll have to have a John Waters film I festival with my mom. I think you should, I think you should. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a funny combination. <laughs> well, you know, the, the idea for this evening, uh, and again, thank you for, for spending so much time with us, um, was to really talk about uh, influences and inspirations. So maybe as a way to get the conversation going, um, let's start by just, where do you find inspiration? Who or what are your influences? Sort of a two-part question, generally speaking. Um, I guess other films and photography has been a big place of, of inspiration for me. And I, um, I've always loved photography and I, my mom encouraged me to start collecting photography when I was a, a teenager. And um, so whenever I s start a film project, I look at photos for a way to articulate what I have in my head to the people that I'm working with. Yeah. Um, so that's a starting point. And are there, are there specific, uh, I mean, we're gonna look at some work by, I assume, ph photographers and uh, artists who you like. Um, are there specific people uh, who you can recall that were early influences as you were introduced to photography or as you, began to kind of explore visual storytelling? Um, yeah, I don't, I think I probably started knowing about it from fashion photography and then mm -hmm. I had a great teacher um, at Art Center, Paul Jasmine, who <coughs> just, we would look through photo books and he would show me photographers from other eras and and I, I loved Eggleston for the color and I remember a photographer called Bill Owens that did portraits in suburbia that I looked at a lot for virgin suicides. Yeah. And, and I'd love to go to um, art fairs with my mom and, and just discover photographs that I connected with. Well, you mentioned Eggleston. Why don't we bring up, um, Ronnie, that first um, image, and we can talk about what, where it fits and why it's uh, relevant as a prompt cool. just to give you a visual. Um, yeah, I just, I love this photo. I, I love his photos. I love um, <coughs> the, the color and, and the atmosphere of his pictures. And um, and this was a picture of girls talking that I had in our, I, I tape pictures of my script when we're shooting to remember things. And there's a scene where um, Elle Fanning, uh, uh, the character of Amy is sad that McBee's been asked to leave and Elle Fanning's leaning over him. And so, so I showed this picture to Philippe, the cinematographer, and, um, and so the, that picture of them 
I don't know, just a reference of just a feeling of kind of the intimacy and, um, between <coughs> girls and um, and and we also like the art department worked together with the costume department to make sure that everything felt um, connected in this world. So we thought about the fabric on the couch and their costumes and and that they're all. I wanted them to all be in the same palette, like they were really all connected and they mm -hmm. weren't they weren't contrasting each other. So uh, Sophia's film, as you all likely know, which opens this weekend, is The Beguiled. Um, the film debuted in, uh, just, just a month ago at the Cannes Film Festival, where Sophia won the Best Director Award. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've had films at the festival before. Tell us a little bit about this year's experience. Tell us a bit about uh, just the, the opportunity to premiere your film there. Yeah, it was so exciting. Um, I had gone as a kid with my dad's films, and and I showed Virgin Suicides, my first film at Cannes, and was um, and it's always nerve wracking because it's you know so people from all over the world, and it's um, e exciting. And, and the Palais where they show the, the films are, you know, there's such a history, and um, and it feels glamorous. So everyone's in black tie, and um, but it's always nerve wracking because they like to be vocal if they don't like movies there. So it's always it was a relief that they um, that people enjoyed our film and laughed and and it was the first time I saw it on a big screen with um, the sound and the film finished and, and for the actors to see it all together. So it was, it was really exciting. So um, we're gonna be looking at other images that that were part of um, some of the influences and inspirations behind the movie, the visual style. Um, did, you, I, did you just watch the film or no? We haven't seen the movie yet. Oh, okay, so I was confused. I, I will try to speak in complete sentences. I thought you guys just watched it. That's why. I Has anyone here seen the film yet? Clap or raise uh, your hand if you've seen that's it. That's what I wanted. So okay, it's just a few people. Yeah, so that image was there's a there's a scene where that's the reference point, but but also the idea of all the women together. Okay. Well, so why don't we do this then, just to take <laughs> a step back? Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the film, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what it's about. But just give us kind of the okay. a, a, an overview. Um, it takes place in a Southern girls' school during the Civil War um, in the South. I said that so. um, with these women that are very cut off from the world, and they take in an enemy. Uh, they find a wounded enemy soldier, and they take him in and kind of nurse him back to health. And and it's um, it's you know I wanted to to really create this very feminine world where he um, he's a big contrast to them. That this you know kind of grubby soldier comes in and and. And it sort of throws her whole house um, upside down because they've been very cut off. We're going to look at a clip in a minute. Not yet. We're going to kind of talk about a couple more inspirations and, and look at a couple more images. Um, the film, uh, notably um, and surprisingly for you, um, is a remake. Or maybe not a remake, but kind of a retelling of a story. I wouldn't call it a remake of that movie at all. It's, it's, it's from a completely different gaze, perspective, um, angle, literally and figuratively. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was there was a Don Siegel, Don Siegel made the film of the Beguiled in 1971 with Clint Eastwood, and that's how I knew about the story. Um, someone told me about it, and then I thought about how I might do that story differently, or or I was curious to tell because it's about a group of women of different ages all living together. I wanted to to kind of reinterpret it and, and tell the same story, but from those characters' point of view. Was it um, in what ways, or was it daunting? to tackle something that had already been interpreted for the screen. You were obviously taking an entirely different perspective on that, but uh, did you have to just sort of let that go or did you even look at it at all? I, I tried to forget about the other film, so I didn't watch it after I saw it that first time. And then I, I tracked down the book that was out of print and um, started to look for kind of editing that of which characters I wanted to include and which ones mm -hmm. I didn't. And there were things about that movie that I enjoyed and some that I didn't connect with, so I tried mm -hmm. to, um, edit down, just think about how I would do the story. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't feel like I was remaking that movie. I felt like I was just going back to this material and this premise. And and it's such, to me, it's such a loaded premise to talk about, you know, the, the mystery between men and women and the power shifts that's at, at in the story and kind of in a genre of this Southern Gothic style and, and how to do that in my own in my own way. Do you think about, and this came up a little bit in the John Waters conversation, but uh, maybe you could elaborate on how you think about the contrast between one film to the next and the writing process and sort of, um, you talked about how sometimes a film of yours might be a re response or reaction to the last one. 
Yeah, I can. Yeah, whenever I finish a film, but when I think about um, what the next one it is, it's always a reaction to the one before it, or I found, and that after Marie Antoinette was so kind of elaborate and decorative, I wanted to do like the most simple, minimal movie that I could, and and some are came out of that idea of how simply we can tell mm -hmm. a story. And then after the bling ring was so in that kind of tabloid world, I it was pretty ugly and I wanted to, I really wanted to make something beautiful and, yeah. and in a really different mode. And when I started thinking about the story, picturing the the, the setting of um, really shooting on location and, yeah. and wanted to do something more, a little more um, beautiful and elegant, hopefully after that world. Well, let's, uh, to talk about maybe the, the look of the film and the, the beauty and the elegance that you're referring to, let's see, why don't we, should we talk about the Joanne Callis piece, maybe? Is, or what, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, this was a photo by um, an artist, Joanne Callis, who I didn't know about. I saw this picture in a newspaper, and then I ordered her book, and, um, and I loved, um, I, I had this image when I was starting to write The Beguiled, because it just something about uh, it's so kind of feminine, and the, I, it reminded me of like the frustration in the story. There's a lot of uh, kind of sexual um, repression and frustration, and and just they're so cut off from the world, and they have no one to interact with. And something about this image made me think of that. There's this very rugged, handsome man suddenly arrives on the doorstep, literally, of this group of women. Yeah, and it was funny because they yeah they haven't seen a man in years, and all of a sudden Colin Farrell shows up and, um, <laughs> and, you know, things, it throws everything in, uh, upside down. Well, you know, as a, as a way to kind of set that up, uh, Ronnie, we'll, let's cue up the, um, the clip. It's a very short scene. It's very, very early in the movie, and I think it is the scene when, um, I think it is the scene when Colin has just arrived. Um, the clip is called Get Him Inside. Do you want to set anything up? Because it's really right near the beginning. Uh, yeah, just at the beginning of the film, the, the youngest student is out in the woods. She comes across this wounded soldier and then brings him back into her, to their, uh, their home, which is the girls' school. Okay. And Nicole Kidman is the headmistress. Okay, let's take a look at a clip. <coughs> Miss Martha! Marie, come with me. that far. Is he dead? Uh, no, not yet. Quick, we need to move him to the porch. And it all begins. That's Miss Farnsworth, her, her seminary for young ladies, yes. And it, something about the story reminded me a little bit of my first film, Virgin Suicides of Them in kind of, I, I pictured them in these kind of faded dresses all trapped in this house, and, and that when you see them all together in their dresses, yeah. you see them really as this group that um, is really connected, and, 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 and they've, they've washed their dresses so many times they're fading, they don't have very much, and they're almost like kind of ghosts. That's that. And without giving away anything, the arrival of Colin Farrell causes a stir among <laughs> this home. To put it lightly. <laughs> Um, I would love to, s to talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned writing, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about your writing process. Um, and as you're writing, do you look to music or other arts, or you mentioned you know, having an image in front of you as you're, as you're writing, or uh, tell us a bit about that, that kind of research process that you're, that you're going through as you're, as you're writing a script. Yeah, I think I, um, I think about the visual world. I'm, like, you know, when you read a book, you imagine it. So I, I went to the book and I started kind of marking things that stood out and trying to decide which characters I would focus on. And then um, just the kind of atmosphere, the, the palette of it comes to mind and I would find, uh, yeah, photo references or paintings to, to kind of illustrate that because I knew that I would be talking to my team about what it's gonna look like. And, and you start to think about what, what they're wearing and, and all these things. And then, um, yeah, sometimes I listen to music. This one, not as much and um, I, I, I think after I wrote the script, I, I, I watched a little bit of the, the Ken Burns documentary and, and, I, and I looked at portraits of the time, of especially a lot of portraits of women and children, um, just to imagine what it was like. And I found um, a, uh, our costume designer, Stacy Batat, had a 
an etiquette book about how they how they had to carry themselves as ladies and, and just just to try to kind of think of what it was like for them and, and journals of women at the time and it, it really struck me this idea of how um, isolated they were and and how they were raised to be you know in society and interacting and attracted to men and all of a sudden everyone's gone and they're just having to learn how to survive. Is, is that process that you mentioned, is it consistent from film to film or are you looking to different uh, sources or, or other images? Maybe you can compare and contrast to some other, some other films in the writing process for a couple of other films and how it may or be maybe similar or maybe different. Okay, yeah, I think, well the writing process is always the hardest part for me. It's always um, a relief to get that finished and, but I, Ad adapting is easier than an original script because you have something to, you have a roadmap of something to turn to, so you don't have the panic of the blank page. So, um, so you I have that panic often uh, the blank page. I, I don't know. It's hard. Writing is hard for me, but I, um, yeah, I, you're and you're alone, and and it's hard to edit out the self doubt, I guess. But when you're adapting something, you feel like it it, it existed, and so somebody somewhere enjoyed it probably, and so you're not. It's not just totally coming from your imagination, but then it's, it's, it's fun because it's a puzzle to figure out how to turn it into a film from a book and, and, then, and then you imagine, or I always try to connect the characters with real people I know so that they become more human and, and then I can bring details from people I know into them. And, um, and I, yeah, I loved the idea of, of this girl's school. I, the idea of like boarding school is always glamorous to me or um, you know, the idea of kind of women off together, living together maybe because I grew up with so many boys that um, <laughs> it sounded fun to be in that world. But um, so th yeah, so then I, then I just go through and mark the book and, and try to distill what, um, what's gonna make it into the movie. Tell me if this is a fair question. What was the easiest film for you to write and what was the, of your films, what was the toughest one to write? Oh, um, I don't know. What they none, of, none of them are easy and they're all yeah, equally difficult? They're or? never easy, but adapting is easier because you have something to work from. And um, Was there one that you that you found that you struggled with or you sort of started and put it aside and came back to it and put it aside or do you kind of power through? Um, I, I think Virgin Suicides was the most exciting because I was learning how to adapt. It was I, I didn't have the rights to that book and I loved that book and I feel like that book made me want to become a filmmaker because I wasn't planning on being a director, but... I love that book so much that I, when I heard they were making a movie, I, I just thought, oh, I had a protect, protectiveness about that book. I thought, oh, I hope they don't mess it up when they make the movie. And, um, and I heard a man was directing it. It was supposed to be really dark. And I thought, like, no, that's not how it should be done. So, I got the book and I started. Um, my dad always talked about adapting and uh, writing. So I thought, as as an experiment, I would just try it a little bit. And then I got so into it, I kept going and, and I finished the script. And by then, I was so connected to it that I um, I met the producers and somehow talked them into them letting me direct it. And it was really only out of wanting to, to make sure that that book was made the way I thought it should be made. And so that was probably, I think, because I was, it was my first script, I I didn't have all the baggage of how it's hard. I, I you know, was, I was trying to figure it out, so it was exciting. Was it um, tough to make that, was it tough that conversation convincing them to let you um, yeah, I was when they had somebody else in mind. They they were pretty op open to it. They were uh, cool. Uh, Chris and Roberta Hanley. They made they kind of you know into art. Made interesting um, movies, and it was a kind of a long process. And I met the writer, and um, but but yeah, I was I was twenty nine, and um, and somehow I I just had to drive just because I loved it so much. I wasn't overly confident, but I just felt so um, I cared so much about it, and yeah. But, um, one of the questions I wrote down was, do you remember the first moment you decided to pursue filmmaking? And it sounds like you're saying this book really was, I mean, you had made, yeah. a, you had made a short. I made a short film. I mean, in my 20s, I, was, I went to CalArts and I wanted to be an artist and I was trying different things. And I was really frustrated that I wasn't good at one thing, but I had so many different interests. And then I made a short film um, just based on something that happened in my junior high, just kind of as a pro project as I was trying different things. And I... And I was surprised how something I just knew how to do from being around my father's sets for my whole life. And yeah. and I was excited because it incorporated the things I loved. It had music and photography and, um, you know, costumes and all these things. So I, I enjoyed it. And that and that gave me the, I guess, the thought that I could actually make a movie when, when I came upon The Virgin Suicides. Were your, was your dad or other members of your family, were they surprised when you said you wanted to direct 
um, a feature? Were they surprised, or, or were they? Sort no, of I think because everyone in my family <laughs> makes films that wasn't <laughs> surprising. And my dad was very encouraging. He actually um, was always talking to my brother and I all the whole time growing up about, you know, when you're writing, you know, by the third act. He was always talking to us as if we were just going to do this too. So <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky. I got a, a good teacher. Film school at dinner. Yeah. Um, but he's so excited, so passionate. And and so excited about film, even now. That, He's an um, amazing man to listen to talk yeah, about film. Yeah, you can't help want to make a movie. At UCLA, after. as I'm speaking numerous times, and he's just such a passionate, like. Yeah, yeah he advocate. really loves film, so. And independent spirit, you know, just yeah. like doing it your own way. And yeah, no, I'm lucky I, I was raised around that. and, and so. Let's pick another image. Um, let me see, hold on. Well, you one of the images you sent is a photo of Steve McQueen, um, and I'd love to know. Uh, yeah. Do we have it? Yes. There, there's a sequence where um, Colin Farrell is like his health is coming back and he's doing garden work and 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 he's really manly in contrast to all the delicate ladies. It's sort of like a it, it was looking like a romance novel cover when we were shooting them. But there was there's one image he's like working in the hot sun with his I don't know if he's a sh I think it's his shirt on. But anyway, he 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 drips wa cold water. This is a reference for there's a shot in the movie with so when you see that you'll know where it comes from. But it's just him being um, rugged and manly, and um, and they're all kind of checking him out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be interesting, because you, you mentioned um, some of your collaborators, some of your team, some of them are folks that you've worked with on n numerous films. So maybe you could um, first, let's talk about your regular set of collaborators. Tell us a bit about who they are, um, and then we'll talk about the process of collaborating with them to develop and, and, uh, and conceive of the look and the, the world of the film. Yeah, I remember in my 20s, somebody giving me the advice to find your team, like to really focus, like spend the next 10 years just honing and finding your team. And um, and it's obviously it's such a collaborative effort to make a movie, so um, it's really important for, to find the people that you click with and, and, and that can help you um, make what you have in your mind and articulate that. So I, um, I met my friend Ann Ross, who's the production designer I've worked with, I, I met her, she went to NYU with my brother and we both worked on a movie in the late 90s together and so we became friends. She was working in the art department and I worked in the costume department and um, we just became friends and we, ha um, and we I don't know what, when we started working together, but um, uh, my f she didn't work on my first film, but when I was doing Lost in Translation, she um, started helping me prepare that and she listened to endless, um, me talking about Bill Murray for years, and um, <laughs> and she, um, but she, yeah. So she, she just, and she's always helpful, and and finding references together, and really just getting what I want to do, and, and helping with the, the visual world to go along with the story. Mm -hmm. So that's Anne. Production that's Anne. Um, and then Stacy Batat, the costume designer. She, we worked on um, Somewhere and Bling Ring, so the last couple movies. And this is our first period film, which. Um, I think she did such a beautiful job, and, and, and I thought she would bring something fresh to it because she wasn't approaching it from an academic way, although she took the, the period ser really seriously and did research, but I, I wanted it to, to be relatable to a modern eye so that she could help pick the clothes when you're looking at the real um, clothes of that time, which ones would, would be more uh, appealing to us, wouldn't look as strange. And with the hairdos, we try to pick ones that, that didn't look so foreign or strange, yeah. and, and how to make it feel just relatable to a modern eye. Are you tough on a costume designer? I, I get involved, but she knows that. And we're friends, and we um, we both are, you know have that in common, so it's fun to work together, because yeah. I, I, get, I probably get more involved than, than some directors. <laughs> but I think about that when I'm writing the character. I think yeah. about what they're wearing, because I think it, you know, it can convey a lot about their personality. Um, so we, yeah, so we work together. Um, for the last three films, and then um, Sarah Flack, my editor, we've worked together since um, Lost in Translation, mm -hmm. and um, she's great. I love working with her. We've yeah, we we've, we've done all of our movies together, and and it's just it's fun. To after the the shoot is really, you know, stressful and rigorous because you only have a certain amount of time to get it all done, and then the edit we can take our time and really discover it together. And and she has we have a really similar sensibility and sense of humor and. Um, and she's really great with music, and so it's that's the part I really enjoy is working with her and, and kind of as it takes shape. So I really I really count on her. When, I, when we were shooting 
the Beguiled, I was thinking, like, oh, I can't wait for Sarah to see this. And, and then to get her feedback was always um, fun. So it's like having someone in mind that you're making yeah. the movie for and that she's going to put it all together. It's interesting to think of that idea of, at that early stage, sort of an audience of one. Yeah, yeah. Time. Just when we shoot a scene, I, 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 was, I couldn't wait to get feedback from her. And, and also she would tell us if there was something helpful if we for needed another shot. But, but just to get her... Um, impression. I remember she said, when I sent her the, the, um, the footage, she said, oh, it's like Terrence Malick with a plot, which I hope <laughs> is not insulting, <laughs> which I was very flattered by. <laughs> that, was, that was her first impression. I probably shouldn't repeat that, but <laughs> with all my respect. I don't think anyone just tweeted that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might have been. Um, let's see. But, um, and then um, Philippe Lassort, the yeah. cinematographer, who um, I loved working with. He's such an artist. He's French cinematographer, and it's our first film together, The Beguiled, and we met um, through Harris Savides, who was my friend and cinematographer that I worked with on Summer and Bling who passed away, and and um, and he, and, and it was really sweet as um, as part of saying goodbye to him, he said, you should meet Philippe Lassorde, because I said, what am I going to do, Harris, because I really counted him so much, and um, and he was such an artist, and um, and I and really trusted him and helped me so much, and so I was happy that he introduced me to Philippe. And we shot a few commercials together, um, which was nice to get to know him, and then I really enjoyed working with him, and he brought so much to it. Is working on commercials in between films, uh, I'm assuming you work with much of the same team, yeah. how, how in what ways does it affect or help or inform what you might be doing in between or Yeah, it's great work? because we, I mean, it's, we have such a nice team and we work well together and it just keeps, you know, we have a shorthand, it's when we go from one project to the other, it, uh, one project to another, it helps to just have that, um, you know, more and more know each other and, um, and, and commercials are a great way, to, or any short films are a great way just to try things out and get to know different people and, and cinematographers and so, um, so I got to know Philippe a little bit until, but then it's very different, you know, being in a off on location for a movie. Um, well, let me see. Let me pick another one here. And I, oh, I don't know if this is inter helpful or interesting, but I, I find coverage to be the hardest thing about directing because oh, it's like that. it's like doing a math, it's like doing math or figuring out where the camera goes so that you get all the pieces for the editor. And I find that always challenging. And um, and people have asked if I storyboard, which I don't do because I don't know until I get on set and where and see the actors where they're going to stand because part of it comes from what what's comfortable for them. But um, Philippe would help me too. We, we would do fo photos, storyboards, and so we'd see the, the actors rehearse, and then we would take photos of all the shots we wanted, and then he would print them out so I could look at and decide which ones. So we didn't. So we only got. We only had time. We didn't have time to just. And you, you want to be efficient anyway, but just to pick which angles um, would would be the best for that scene. So, so on a scene by scene basis, having those reference points and then kind of sitting down in front of them. Yeah, it'd be, it was sort of like making an instant storyboard, but it helped me instead of having a diagram to have the the image of what the frame would be and to decide which frame and which lens, too. I mean, it, you know, Harris was such an amazing photographer, and uh, I can only imagine that the, you know each DP has their own style and approach, but are there is there, a, is there any kind of natural connection between the two in the way that you work with them, or is there anything? I think that they're just the sensitivity that, that they're real artists, and, and, um, and they have that in common, and, and that they're sensitive and, and really... Um, you know, wanting to help me express the, the story. So the, the kinds of image was images that we're seeing, and I think maybe the next one we'll bring up is uh, Notorious uh, Hitchcock. Um, are, who's seeing oh, yeah. these? Uh, you're, you're finding things like this, or someone might be bringing you something. Yeah, and, uh, Help us understand how images like this will help you or are part of the process. Yeah, Anne um, mentioned the scene in Notorious where um, the poison is in the coffee, so we looked at this, we watched the scene when, when there's a scene in our movie involving Poison? Is that giving? Don't well, say much okay, I won't say it. There's a scene that well, there's something a table scene that we um, <laughs> <laughs> that we 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 looked at this to to I because um, the story has I wanted to have a lot of tension and and have some suspense. So of course we have to turn to Hitchcock for, to to learn about that. But I I think um, yeah, watching that that scene we, we looked at for the kind of the the emphasis on on the cup and um and and how they uh, how he built suspense. There's one more Hitchcock, and I'm just going to throw it in now since we're talking about Hitchcock. Is that? Is this one? Um, with to Catch the Thief? Is that, am I wrong? Did Hitchcock make it to Catch the Thief? Wait, am I? 
Yeah, I guess. I forgot I should know. Sorry. Um, this is from To Catch a Thief. It's Grace Kelly, and it's a reference for Nicole Kidman's character. There's a scene in the, in the last section of the film where she comes out in, in silhouette, and um, so I just had this. I always wanted to get um, that shot. That was something that Anne showed me also, and um, so yeah, it's, there's a scene at the end where she's walking down a hall, and, and I loved how she was in silhouette. Um, and when you see the scene, hopefully, <laughs> if there's a, there's a, some kind of a little bit of mystery and suspense at that moment. And help us understand the sort of dynamic of working together. Are you are you sitting with your whole team looking at these images, or are you doing this in a kind of more independent, individual way at various points in the process, or, or h how much of that is happening? Uh, yeah, this time usually I make a book, but this time we made um, you know like mo big mood boards that that. Then when Anne and Stacy and Philippe and I would meet together, we would look at them all together. So we were all on the same page so that all the elements were all connected to the same mood or tone. And, yeah. and we had different ones for, we kind of broke it down in, in acts because the first act is a very different look um, yeah. than the last section when it kind of shifts. And so how do we do that visually? And because you're, we, weren't, we weren't shooting in order, so when we were going to a scene from the last section, the the camera angle and the colors would change and, um, and the art department I think would do little things that I don't think you notice consciously, but the at the beginning it's very, his, the surroundings are very lacy and comfortable, and then as the story goes, they would take things away and make it more stark, and um, and it kind of shifts of whether he's a guest or a prisoner. I think we should talk about the casting for a minute um, to give people sort of an understanding, a little bit of a tease into the world of. Um, these women, and some of them you've worked with before, some of them are very well known, some of them not so much, but maybe help us understand sort of as you were thinking about um, who would be right for each role, was, were you thinking about that in the writing process or did it happen um, along the way? Yeah, it always helps me to, to picture actors when I'm writing and, and when I started thinking about this, I thought, oh, Kirsten can play the teacher and I would love for Elle, who was 11 when I worked with her, now is old enough to play one of the older students, and I, you know, I always, I always loved working with her and wanted to work with her again for both of them, and um, and then I thought, oh, I, I started picturing Nicole Kidman as the headmistress as my fantasy, and um, why her for that role? There's just something about that character that I knew that she could bring humor to it, and also it would be very imposing and regal, and um, and I just saw her in that. I, I, I've always loved her, and especially in To Die For, she, I think she does Twisted so well. Um, so it helped me to picture her um, when I was writing, and, and luckily she said yes to, to do the part. But I think when you see it, she's so, um, just her posture and how she carries herself. And also to have a really great actress that, that would make the character human, and not because it could have turned into a, a camp fest. So I knew that she would keep it. All, all these actresses were talented and would make them feel real. Which You're was playing with that tone. There's, there's some camp moments and there's some amazing lines that are, that are, that are Already probably bumper stickers, but um, it, tell tell us a little bit about the tone and how you sort of decided this to sort of the right tone to strike for this story. Yeah, I think we were we wanted to make sure that um, I mean it was playful and there was a lot of and there are funny moments of the story for sure and and all the kind of dynamics in the glances and so I wanted it to be heightened and have all this kind of um, heat of the South and sexual repression, but then how to really get into that without being just totally over the top campy and um, and to find the tone and I think on set, you know, we found that and then in the editing to keep that so that you can still be emotionally connected and, and it still be naturalistic. Let's see, I want to talk about just filmmaking more generally. Um, what do you like about filmmaking uh, and what do you consider the most persistently challenging, difficult or frustrating part of filmmaking? Uh, what I like about it is um, that you get to create this world and have it exactly how you want, uh, you know, unlike life, that you can have this one um, moment where it's exactly how you imagine, or uh, I guess creating a story, it, there, there's just, it, to me it's more like there's something comes in your head and you, you, it just nags at you and you have to get it out and uh, have, have it be expressed, so that's, that's where it comes from, it just, when, when something comes in my head then I, it bugs me until I can, Express it, I guess, and um, and what 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 is the hardest? What's the like? toughest, most challenging, difficult, um, frustrating? Any of those part of filmmaking? I think I mean for me, writing is the hardest. Um, we talked a little bit about that, and um, 
and I enjoy the editing. And I think it's always a struggle to get a movie together, to get it made, to get the financing. And yeah. um, that's always a struggle, and, you know, because it's always, yeah, it's always hard to put a movie together and then it's a relief somehow it actually gets made. It, it's certainly no easier now than it's, I mean, it's really tough right now, um, even yeah. for an established filmmaker. Um, I don't, I don't want to be discouraging, <laughs> but it, yeah, but, I think real, it, yeah. but it's, I mean, for me, I always try to keep the budgets as small as possible so that um, there's not too much pressure that it only has to make back that amount so I can make another one. And um, I think it's, it's great to make movies as, you know, keep the scale manageable if you can. You were, uh, you were talked about in relation to a, a remake retelling of a big Disney movie, Little, uh, Little, Little, Mermaid. Little Mermaid. Yeah, what that was, was, what was intriguing about that? It that didn't happen, obviously, or it's not happening. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't the Disney version. It's actually the, the original fairy oh, tale, which is much you. darker. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I thought it'd be fun to do a fairy tale. I've always loved fairy tales. And, um, and so I was curious about doing that, but then I, it didn't end up. It became too big of a scale. I wanted to shoot it really underwater, which would, would have been a nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, because underwater photography is so beautiful. So we even did some tests. And it, yeah, w I, I can't, I, it was not very realistic, the approach. But it was interesting to think about. What happens um, when you're trying to tell a story at that scale? You said it became so it would have, wouldn't become so big. So when what happens to the process for you as a storyteller? For me, when a movie gets on a when it has a really lar large budget like that, it just becomes more about business, or business becomes a bigger element than um, art. I think than when, when it's smaller, it's it's less of, there's less people involved because it's not so much at risk business wise. So. I'm gonna take a look here and see what else we have. Got it. Do we have just one more? Yeah. We're gonna soon have questions from the audience, so get ready. <laughs> one more picture. Oh yeah. This one. Uh, let's see. Wait, I have the name of the photographer. Uh, is it L Yel Yelena Yem? Oh, is it? Yel uh, Yelena I didn't even Yemchuk? Know. Yeah, she's, she's a, a Ukrainian. Yeah, she's photographer. a fashion photographer. Yeah. I, I didn't even realize. I know. I know her, but I didn't realize she took that picture. I. Um, because we had so many r random pictures, but yeah, she's a fashion photographer. And, um, so what was it about this one? This was just, we have a scene with Kirsten Dunst looking out a window, and we have some uh, lacy curtain in front of her face, so it was just a reference to remember <coughs> that we wanted to have the layers of the lace in front of her. And when, when you see the movie, you'll see Kirsten looking out the window and the lace and, um, and watching Colin doing his, <laughs> his gardening work. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, it was just, yeah, just a reminder. I, I just like the image of the lace in front of her. And, and so much of the, the open, the, the world was very lacy and feminine and they did needlework and sewing and, um, and, and just really to have this contrast of the, the ladies' feminine world with the outside war. And you hear cannons in the distance and the, the world of the men was a real contrast to, to them. So when you're in the creative process, the writing process, or as you're embarking on a new film, are you just ripping and tearing pages from magazines and clipping stuff online. I mean, you must have just volumes of... Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely am always collecting images that remind me um, of, of a shot or, or a mood or something about the character. So I'm, I think I'm always looking, you know, grabbing, grabbing stuff that I come across. Um, we're going to talk about music because, and I want to thank anyone in the audience who suggested uh, the, the music we played as you were arriving um, was all music that you, you, requ you requested or suggested on Twitter yesterday. So thank you for doing that. Um, we have to talk about music, and my question is, um, besides Phoenix, put them aside, uh, <laughs> who are some of your all-time favorite bands? Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about the music that's meaningful to you. Oh, Artists or songs or... Yeah, I, mean, I guess just the music that I grew up with. I have, um, my older brother had good taste in music, luckily, so um, I just, he would drive me to school and we'd listen to Elvis Costello and The Clash, and so those are, um, they're my favorites. And, um, and I, I love New Order and um, I guess the music of that, the 80s <laughs> of the era. Um, but, um, but I like all different kinds of music and I, and I put music that I love in, in the movies that I work on and I try to, you know, that helps build the atmosphere of, of whatever the story is. And um, when we were doing Lost in Translation, it was this kind of whole jet lag feeling of that kind of dreamy pop and my Bloody Valentine I listened to a lot in my 20s when I was, um, you know, thinking about that character in that time and um so yeah i don't know what to say what I, was I always grew up going to bands because i lived near san francisco i lived in the country i grew up in napa valley and um and that was a fun time to go into the city and go see bands and it was kind of during the whole sub pop thing and yeah what was one of your favorite uh concerts of uh, that era anybody that anyone um, that kind of 
Oh, I remember like the Meat Puppets and, and Mud Honey and that era of being exciting. I can't remember a particular one. Um, and, and and seeing Prince was always, I mean, I, Purple Rain was. Incredible performer. Yeah. yeah hours yeah. and hours on end, yeah. just all the way through. Yeah. Let me see, what else do I want to ask you about in terms of, oh, in terms of music, I remember it. Um, the other day with John Waters, I, I didn't realize this. Um, you had a obsession with Joe Strummer. Oh yeah, I told him. I want to <laughs> yeah. hear more about that. I, um, they probably do too. Oh, okay. I, um, well, I love The Clash and I, and I had a crush on Joe Strummer and um, my, there, was a, there was a sound mix studio at my, at my, at my parents' property where my dad would do his films and Alex Cox was working on that movie Willow. Do you know Alex Cox had said Nancy, which I love that soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Um, and um, and I looked. I was driving in my convertible. And I looked up and I was blasting the Clash. And I looked up and Joe Strummer was standing there. And I died. I almost died. Like it was so <laughs> it's one of my, uh, you know, thrills that of was my that teenage. Um, I mean, he was he was at a distance, but then then I went back with my friends, and, like groupies, to like hang out at the sound mix. Like and watch. Yeah, <laughs> but it was. Yeah, but I'll never forget looking up and seeing Joe Strummer standing there. Um, let's see. How about movies? Um, were there movies when you were a kid that were your fa that were what were some of the movies that, as a kid that were your favorite, or are there movies now that are kind of still like <coughs> your go-to kind of memorable movies? Yeah, I mean, I loved I loved John Hughes movies because those were the ones that I felt like were the yeah. closest to what it was like to be a teenager, and and um, and not many people got that right, so. I have a soft spot. I love John Hughes, and um, but then my dad always showed us um, interesting movies, and I remember seeing *Breathless* by Godard, and and just you know making such a big impression on me, and you know the whole French New Wave was always the coolest. Was your dad just like constantly watching, 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 watching movies? Uh, yeah, he, he was. He was always. Um, I mean, yeah, they they had a screening room, and they would, and he was watching movies, and so so we were, yeah, kind of. He he loved Kurosawa, and I, you know, I was a kid, and kind of wandering in and out and not really paying so much attention, but I feel lucky that we were exposed to to movies and, and then Purple Rain, I saw that and um, that was like my sexual awakening seeing Purple Rain <laughs> at 12 or something. Tell us more about <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't know, what, what, what's there to see it, but I remember seeing that like the local movie theater and um, yeah, and being impressed and um, I, I'm trying to think, I mean, of course, movie, and I remember seeing Gone with the Wind at our local movie theater at the, I guess they, they um, they restored it yeah. in the 80s or something, yeah, and yeah. seeing that on a big screen really was, you know, impressive. And when, when I was thinking about Southern Bells, although our story is much more naturalistic, you know, you can't help thinking about Scarlett O'Hara when you think about a, a Southern lady. Yeah. Um, but I don't, yeah, I can't. It's hard to think of the the movies that um, impressed me, but <coughs> so many movies now, um, even some of the classics you mentioned. Uh, won't be seen on a big screen like that, but they might be seen on, you know, on, a, on Netflix or on Filmstruck or something like that. I mean, how do you, where do you stand on this notion of sort of, and it was a big debate in Cannes this year, or like sort of the big yeah. screen versus, you know, uh, online. Yeah, I think the cool thing about streaming is that, you know, you have access to so, such great libraries. And also for filmmakers, I think it's exciting that you, that your movie doesn't have to just be 90 minutes or you know a feature length that you could do something that's six hours long or you could make a short because I remember when I was starting that it was very hard to show your short there's no market for it now it seems like you could make something that was 30 minutes or whatever um, and, uh, and I think it's given more opportunity to, to film it. independent filmmakers yeah. um, definitely Tamara Jenkins my friend is making a film now for Netflix that you know I'm just happy those kind of movies g get to be made but um, I think the great thing about living in New York is being able to see old movies projected, and I, I'm always, yeah, it's, I'm always so impressed. I get so much more from it seeing it in a theater. It's such a different experience, and I think, especially in our modern lives where we're always connected, it's hard to totally disconnect at home when you're watching a movie. When you go in a theater, to really just get lost in another world, I think um, I, I appreciate more and more. Do your kids watch TV and movies a lot, or do you restrict them, or do you? How do um, you they watch movies, but they have. I'm worried they have such bad taste in movies. Like I've given in. Young, they're young. I know, but I've given in. I want the. I they wanted to see La La Land, and I said, well, you have to see um, Singing in the Rain and Umbrellas of Sherbrooke before you can see that. And they're like, I don't want to see an old movie. And and I feel like, I, yeah, I feel like a failure as a parent that I haven't exposed them to a richer culture of cinema. So you we'll see what happens. Sitting a grandpa for a little while. Yeah, exactly. But there, yeah. But we watched Trading Places the other day, which was fun. Yeah. Really? 
<laughs> yeah, so that was fun. And I, I love that movie, so it was fun to watch them. But they, they were really confused with Jamie Lee Curtis taking her top off for no reason. And they're like, why is she taking her top off? I was like, I don't know, it's the 80s and a man directed it. <laughs> That's all you have to say. It says it all. Um, uh, what about photographers? Are there, are there photographers that you, you've mentioned, Eggleston? Are there others who you go back to or that, that are especially meaningful to you, either have been or still are? Yeah, I love um, I, I love Eggleston. I love Lee Freelander and Helmut Newton. And um, I'm drawing a blank. There's uh, I'm trying to think of because I, I have some photographs and, and um, I love Tina Barney and um, Larry Sultan and um, yeah, I've, I've always loved photography and I and it and it and I and it taught me a lot for filmmaking and I I started out wanting to be a photographer and I think um, doing photo shoots I definitely learned things that I take with me in films and one thing I learned from that is if there's some little thing that bugs you like make sure you fix it because it's gonna bug you later like if you if someone's lapel isn't right like you just change it because if not it's gonna bother you no you're, you're, you're perfect but I think that was something I hope someone can remember that fix it when you can it's gonna yeah because if, if it comes it comes to your mind it's gonna bug you so pay attention to that okay, well, I have to ask you about you directed an opera Tell us about that experience. Tell us about why you did that and, and what that was like. Yeah, I was, um, I had just kind of left the Little Mermaid project and Valentino, the man, called me and said, would you... Um, <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> the he real Valentino. Calls, like, well, his representative, I guess, said, would you come meet Valentino? And he... Um, he said he, yes. He's going to the costumes for La Traviata and would you do this? And I thought, oh, this is terrifying. I don't know anything about this. I've never worked in the theater. But of course I couldn't say no, so I said yes, and I went and met Valentino, and um, it was really a thrill to see him, watching him do these costumes <coughs> and to work in the Rome Opera House. He said he'd come to Rome for a month and direct an opera, and I thought, well, I, I have to try this, and it was terrifying, and I was relieved when it was over, but I really enjoyed it, and, and also it was, really, it was really touching that everyone working in the theater, they weren't doing it for money, they all loved it, and it, it um, yeah, I felt, I, I got a lot from it. Do you think there's aspects of that experience or, or of the process that you might, that you could see translating to cinematic, or is, are they just such different worlds? They're really different, and, and I rely so much on my cinematographer, and that's how you create the emotion of the character for me, is where the camera is, and I don't know how you do that on stage, so it made me um, more open to the idea of trying something on stage, maybe in theater one day, because I kind of got over the fear of how you do that, and, um, and, and it was interesting just to learn about, it was La Traviata, so the characters, you know, a party girl, and I could connect that it was a, a woman, the character, so I could get into that, and it was very, you know, party scenes and kind of lavish, so I, I enjoyed it, and it was it was also interesting to learn um, really the story of an opera so I can really follow along and know what each moment was happening, because I never studied an opera before, um, and, and I just, I, I, th I think it's good to always push yourself to do something <coughs> scary and out of your comfort zone. I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions in a moment, and um, people's hands are already going up. And I was, when I was doing the opera, it was, it was a year ago, I was on the phone with Focus, <coughs> like talking about the budget and trying to get our movie together, and it, it, didn't, it didn't look good, so I'm thrilled that I'm here a year later and that the movie is, that you're going to see it. <laughs> this weekend in theaters. Um, one last question for me. Um, I haven't asked you about Bill Murray yet, and <laughs> we haven't talked about even uh, A Very Merry Christmas. But um, when did you, when, when did Bill Murray, when, did, when was Bill Murray like sort of something for you? When did, when did you first see him or when did you first tell know. us about when you met him? Or that's a good question. Why was he meaningful? I, that's a good question. I, I'm, I, mean, I loved his movies. I, I, I love him in Tootsie and in Groundhog Day. And um, yeah, I always love Bill Murray. Who, who doesn't really? Um, and I remember watching SNL as a kid um, in, in his era, in The Lounge Singer, because I always love him singing, and that comes from my early memories of him as The Lounge Singer. But um, <laughs> I don't know how, um, when I was working, in, when I was writing the script of Lost in Translation, I, I think it was just my like the fantasy of like if Bill Murray would come, take you know, go on an adventure <laughs> or something. And I, I was writing that at the same time as Marie Antoinette. I was going back and forth, and I, oh, I found it really helpful to write two things at the same time because. When you get stuck on one, then you can go to the other one and back and forth. And um, and I started that. I just remember like on yellow pads, writing little kind of moments, and then trying to string the moments together to to make a film. And um, and yeah, so I just pictured him, and I wasn't going to make the movie without Bill Murray. Um, so it was really, I really wanted to make <coughs> this 
film about my experiences in Japan, and I just was determined, and I spent like a year stalking him, trying to meet people that knew him, and, uh, and I had a friend, Mitch Glazer, who's a writer, who was friends with him, and he, I asked him to look at my early pages, and he thought it was something worthwhile, and, and mentioned to Bill, and, um, and yeah. <laughs> He can be tough to reach. He can be tough to trace. Sort of yes, a nomadic guy. Yes, he's guy. very mysterious. Doesn't have an agent, and um, and people kept saying, "Well, what's your what's your backup plan?" I was like, "No, I don't have a backup plan. It has to be Bill Murray." <coughs> and um, and then I got a call. I, I, I left. I'm sure you've heard the stories about the 800. He has an 800 number. He had to leave messages, and um, and it really yes. went on for endless. It was really humiliating, and just I spent a year. But I, you know, I was determined in sending letters, and then finally one day I got a call from my friend Mitch in New York saying I'm at a I'm at a restaurant with Bill Murray, and he says can you come over? Like it's a I felt like I was on on hold for a year, and I I went over and he was wearing a seersucker suit I'll never forget, and um and yeah he was very nice and he thought he said he would think about it, but um but I never knew he was definitely in like we didn't have a contract or anything and I. I was in Japan spending money in the hopes that Bill Murray was showing up. And he had said that, you know, that he was thinking <laughs> about it. And, and he said, he, he, Murray said, I might be inclined. And I thought, I just took that as a yes. <laughs> and, um, and, and one of the best things I learned about my dad is that you just start, like, if you want to make a movie, you just have to start making it, even if you don't have the money or anything. You just have to start, and hopefully people will follow. And um, so, and, yeah, somehow we, we raised a couple million dollars and found ourselves in Tokyo and he showed up and <laughs> I didn't have a backup plan. Or maybe, so. don't worry. Yeah, maybe. so I was glad okay. he showed up. Well, let's, let's give this crowd a chance to ask questions. Um, and we're gonna bring the lights up. I think, do we have <coughs> microphones? Tell me somebody, yes or no. We do. Okay, come on down to the front. I, I saw your hand first, so you get to go first and then we'll work our way through. Hi. Um, so Somewhere is probably my watch, most watched film of yours. But as a 22-year-old, Bling Ring probably unfortunately speaks to my generation <laughs> the most. And I was curious about your process in <coughs> discovering like my generation and understanding my generation, working with the actors in translating my generation so well. Oh, thank you. I'm glad because I felt like really <coughs> a, of a different generation. And, um, and I... I think that, I mean, like the actors helped me because they were close to those kids, and um, and I just, you know, I tried to imagine uh, what the real kids. I tried not to be judgmental about the real kids, even though they were robbers. <laughs> um, but you know, to imagine the, you know, wanting to be part of a group and and <coughs> wanting to to find. Um, I know it just it's hard to find your identity at that age, so it's easier to assume someone else's, and that's what I thought it was about, and try to look at it from their point of view, and um, and but yeah, it was funny to to be in those clubs with bottle service, and it was a very foreign world to me, but just to try to get in the minds of the characters like you do for an, any story and imagine um, you know, what, what it could be like for them and what, what's driving them. So thanks. Mm. Um, there's two women kind of sitting near each other in the center of the <coughs> back area. Maybe you can start and then pass it to the woman behind you. Hi. Is this on? <coughs> it is. Awesome. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for making Lost in Translation. I think I probably, I don't know, I wouldn't be here without it probably because it's made such a huge impact on my life. Oh, year thank after year. you. Just put the mic a little no. closer to your mouth. There you thank go. you. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Um, your taste in music is suspiciously good, and I, I know you mentioned that there's not a lot of I just of don't guile. reveal my guilty <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> uh, but in terms of new music, what are you listening to in 2017? Oh yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty cut off. I need to pay more attention, but um, I think since having kids, I've neglected <laughs> that side. But I, I really like the XX. That's uh, okay. Um, and I go to a lot of Phoenix shows because. <laughs> 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 but, um, but otherwise, um, my kids have taken over our Spotify, and so there's a lot of. I, I, I took my ten-year-old to a Megan Trainer concert. <laughs> I'm hearing like pop music from them all the time, but um, but yeah, I need to pay more attention. That's fine. The XX is perfect. Thank yeah, you. I like the XX a lot. <laughs> right behind you. Hi. All right, well, hello. First off, just a really quick question. Were you at GovBall? 
No, no, I wasn't. Okay, all right. I was like, I was wondering because I was like standing where like there was a group of people, and I was like, <laughs> is she there? Like, uh, no, I missed is, it. Is my lady there? But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I'm sorry, I missed it. I, I so, um, so I am a filmmaker, and one of my favorite things to like experiment with film is like moments of peace. And so in Lost in Translation, probably one of my favorite scenes in any film ever, Lost in Translation is like number one in my film Thank list. You. Like, <laughs> but um, <coughs> is the scene where um, Charlotte is, goes into the flower arranging like, class. Oh, really? So I was talking, both of my parents, my mom is here, are film people. And so I was talking with my dad about it. And we were talking about how like, flower arranging is sort of the practice for women when it comes to Buddhism. So I was wondering if you were like, were thinking about um, Buddhism as like a source during Lost in Translation and you were like sort of projecting that in that scene or just, I don't know, I was just sort of like wondering about Buddhism and your relation to that in Lost in Translation. Oh, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about her trying to understand spirituality and she was, <coughs> you know, kind of having this existential crisis and trying to understand how to feel connected because she didn't feel connected in her life. So so that when she comes upon this Gibana class, the people there all are having some connection and she doesn't feel it and she's trying to feel it. So I, there's something about her trying to feel connected. So I think that relates to what you're what you're saying. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well the microphone's still back there. So why don't we take a few more questions from the back and then we'll come back up to the front. It's hard for me to totally see whose hands are up, but um, there's some people in the back. There we go. Hi, Sophia, uh, big fan. Um, what's your next big project? <coughs> what are you doing next? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just, we've been working on stuff. We shot this last fall, um, The Beguiled, and we're just putting it out now, so I haven't really taken a break, so I'm, I'm looking forward to summer vacation <coughs> and, um, and then trying to figure out what, try, if I'll ever do this again. <laughs> right after you do a movie, you're like, I can't imagine ever doing it again, but, that, but they say it's like childbirth, you forget. The pain, so I haven't gotten there yet. Do you write on vacation, or do you totally have to just unplug and kind of? I, tr fresh? I, tr I try to unplug, and, and but um, I started working on Beguiled when I was on vacation, just looking at the book, and I remember like kind of doing it in the midst of that. But I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try to um, just space out. So there's some folks sort of on this, yep, yeah, there, and then on this other side too. Hi, so um, with your recent success at cons and the recent success of the uh, Wonder Woman movie, I was wondering if there are any female uh, directors that you look to for your source of inspiration or even uh, camaraderie. Yeah, I, Jane Campion was a big hero to, to me and, and a big um, role model for me and I was really thrilled to get to meet her a few years ago and she was at Cannes this year and came to my film and she's so supportive of other women and. Tamara Jenkins, my friend, she's making a new movie and I love her films and, and we, um, our kids go to the same school and we have coffee after drop off and talk about um, being women filmmakers and the challenges. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, I'm trying to think, yeah. But Jane Campion was always a, a big hero of mine. So we're up in that back corner. <coughs> Hello. Um, my question is about Marie Antoinette, um, which is a film that I love. Um, and I'm glad that it's had sort of a, I know it was mixed when it was released, but I'm glad it seemed to be a talk of much, you know, last night here at the Film Society, we, a few of us were having a conversation and almost everyone in the circle mentioned that it was their favorite film of yours. Oh wow, that's nice to hear. And I'm wondering, as an artist, putting out a piece that you worked so hard on, that was so much time and so much effort, to receive such kind of a mixed response at can or critically or however, what you as an artist do to self-care with something like that, when you feel like there's some negative reaction, some positive reaction, something that you feel so vulnerable about it, how you self-care as an artist? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because as an artist, <laughs> you're sensitive, or I, you know, I'm sensitive, so it's hard to, to hear criticism, but, um, but I've always thought I'd rather make something that people really love or really hate and not in the middle, because um, that would be the, the worst, I think. So I'm happy if, you know, I just want to connect with some people and I'm not, trying to connect with everybody, you know, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's hard when people misinterpret what you're doing, and, and people can get so kind of angry about it, what do you, like, I'm just trying to make a movie, I don't mean to offend anyone, <laughs> so I don't know, but I understand if it's not your, you know, not your thing, but, um, but I think people are, I think people are, like, yeah, a little bit mad about how I treated that, 
period of the history, and I, you know, I, I had good intentions, and I, no, and I loved, I, you know, it was really, um, it was amazing for me to be able to shoot in Versailles, and, and to, you know, she was such a kid, so I really wanted to embrace the teenage side, so I'm happy that it, um, that it lives on, and people enjoy it, and I try to not, yeah, try not to think too much about, you know, everyone's opinion, so I can just um, keep making things. Our microphone is on the move. Hi, Sophia. Two questions. Two recent films that you watched and you were inspired or you liked. And your relationship uh, to Italian cinematography, Fellini, Bertolucci, Rossellini, and nowadays Paolo Santino. <coughs> so what do you get any inspiration from Italian cinematography? And the question is about two last films that you watched that you feel inspired by. So two recent films and then... And then Italian, uh, cinematography. Italian cinematography. Well, I, I'm fortunate to have gotten to know Vittorio Storaro growing up, who was yeah. a great cinematographer that worked with my father. And he was always, he's always been very kind. And I remember as a little kid him talking to me in a very serious way. And um, so that made a big impression on me. And, you know, of course, even uh, there's a shot in the Bugawa where the camera goes to the curtains and we were thinking about like the leopard. And I, I love the culture of Italian cinema. And of course, um, Dolce Vita is one of my favorite movies, of course, and um, and uh, it's such a rich culture of film. Um, and a recent movie that two recent Two movies recently that, that oh. stuck with you? or that The last one I saw in the movie theater was a, a Frederick Wiseman documentary, Model, which um, I love him. He's so inspiring to me. And um, I had seen The Store at MoMA, and um, and he, if you don't know his work, you can. He has a website, and you can buy. The, you can order the DVDs directly. Otherwise, I think they might be hard to find. But yeah. Frederick Wiseman is. Um, I love his documentaries. They're so. Um, <coughs> I love that there's no story, and you're just a fly on the wall in these particular places. So that was really seeing his work was really inspiring to me. Beautiful film. Yeah. Beautiful work. I think is the retrospective still going on. It was a film forum, end? but yeah. I think it. I think it's over because um, I missed high school. I wanted to see that, oh, but I saw Model yeah. there, and yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. Okay, where are we now? We're over in this corner, in this area? I guess down here, and then we'll come back around here. So just, uh, yeah, and then we'll come up here. Hi there. Here, here. Um, we've kind of been dancing around this, but I wanted to ask how uh, the music for The Beguiled came about, what the process was like creating it, and what kind of direction you gave. Yeah, the, um, the soundtrack for The Beguiled is probably the most different than my other films because it doesn't, um, it's very minimal and stark and, um, Phoenix had done a little bit of music for somewhere and these kind of keyboard tonal things that, <coughs> it's not very articulate, but you know what I mean. Um, so I asked them to do the music and I wanted it to be just kind of <laughs> underlining the tension and, and, not, um, and not giving too much emotion, but I wanted it to contrast a little bit with the picture by having keyboard tones and not period music. And um, But when we were in the edit, we found that we didn't want I don't know, I didn't want too much music because it, it, it feels more tense just focusing on the sounds of the nature and the cicadas and you hear a few cannons in the distance. So it's, it's pretty minimal. There's, there's not a sound, soundtrack album. But, um, and then the music at the end, I asked, well, I asked Phoenix for all the music, but they, they did one piece at the end that, that I really love that when they, I, they sent it to me, um, I would send them you know, clips of scenes and they would send back music and the, the last music, I, it's kind of the, the most, the most music in the whole movie where it kind of has the most evocative feeling and, um, and kind of leaves you in the, the, the emotion of the movie. Uh, let's see, where we'll be yeah, here Hi. and then we'll go over. Hi, um, I'm a huge fan and I just want to say well done on The Beguiled and winning the best award in Cannes. Um, I actually wrote my film thesis on you and... Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> And I just want to know, um, I was dealing with all your films and I was looking at your, per your film work through a perspective of feminist work and um, auteur theory. And I just want to know, do you see yourself as a feminine auteur? And then how do you consider your female characters um, with using the male gaze in that sort of cinematic style? Um, using the male gaze theory um, and how do you see your female characters how do you interpret your female characters with the male gaze? I guess I don't think about the male gaze. I think about my gaze, and I, I connect with the characters. <laughs> no, I just, when I, when I look at a story, I connect more to the female characters, and so that's what interests me that, you know, um, but I don't, I never, I never 
thought about it as just naturally I'm interested in these characters and I want to tell their stories. And um, and with the Beguiled, it was interesting to me to have um, female characters from different ages. I have you know, from 12 to 40s and, and to be able to connect to each one with experiences from my life or things that I can relate to. And um, so I feel like, um, I mean, even with Lost in Translation, I related to Bill, I put some of myself in Bill Murray's character too, but in general, I, I relate more to the female characters because it's, it's something more in my experience that I can relate to. And, um, and, and I try to, um, you know, I wanted, I like films by actors. I like seeing the personality of the filmmaker and not anybody could have made this. It had to come from that person. Those are the kind of movies that I love and, and what I want to make. And, and, and I always enjoy seeing different um, points of view that I don't know about. So um, that's something that I love and I want to uh, be part of that tradition. We're almost out of time, so I want to get a few questions from this area. Yes, here, and then the woman in front of you. Go ahead. Hi, Sophia. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about, you were talking about like the blank page fear. Um, and so my question is, how do you kind of get over that blank page fear, especially for your movies like Lost in Translation or somewhere where it isn't like a adapted piece where you can latch on to something? Yeah, I don't know. It's always hard. I just think, um, you know, I, I it's, it starts with kind of little moments and then taking notes and then little by little you just gather more of them. And a friend of mine was saying that she just does index cards until she has a big pile of them. And um, but I don't, I don't know. I just I guess it starts with some little idea of what you're thinking at the time or something you see, and and then by collecting notes. Um, they start to take a shape. I know that's not very helpful, but um, but I do, yeah, I think it just, as you get more and more, then it gets to be encouraging. I love Final Draft because it starts to look like a script, so <laughs> just having it in that format feels productive, and, um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I just, um, you know, I just, you just have to keep, keep at it and keep adding to the little, the little ideas that come, the, kind of just the moments, I like guess, especially those movies are very much about moments and they're not big plot driven so they're more about the characters and just kind of s daydreaming and spending time with the character and and also I think it's also important to have time I call it putter time where you're not doing anything where you just have time to walk around and look at books and I think it's hard in a busy life and also with phones all the time it, like it, nobody's ever spacing out it's really hard to you need that time to just be able to daydream and um, so I think trying to be have more time of cut off from the interactive world is important for a writer. Mm. Just a couple more. There's a woman here, and then we'll go to this side. Yeah. Hi. So this must be popular opinion. I also wrote my undergraduate thesis oh. on Marie Antoinette. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Flattered. Um, Honored. And I'm wondering if there is any film scholar or film scholarship that you've really taken to throughout your writing process or just in general. Film scholar of someone who writes about film? Yeah, or, or just film scholarship, like something that you've read in general that really inspired you? Oh, no, I haven't. Um, I, I didn't go to film school. I didn't read that much about. Uh, my dad gave me a book, I think, by Toby Cole that's Directors on Directing. Do you know that book? I think it's a textbook, mm -hmm. so I have that, and I've looked at that a little bit. And I, I mean, I've read um, Ily Kazan's, um, I guess his On Directing, yeah, that book. I have that. Well, it's each chapter on different films. I found that really interesting to read about. Um, I think it, it talks about Streetcar Named Desire and him wanting to. I talked a lot about the heat, which is something that I thought about in the Beguiled shooting in the South. So I think, um, yeah, so I've read some Ellie Kazan, but I'm not so well read on the topic. Hi. Um, I was just wondering because um, a lot is, you know, your reputation is for like photography and shorter scripts. So when you work with someone like Anna Ferris or Bill in Lost in Translation or like the characters in um, Bling Ring or, I don't know, I was just curious about your, how you direct comedy or is it a lot of it's found in rehearsal or improv or because you're so specific with the visuals, like do you, are you kind of more relaxed with the actors or? Yeah, I mean, I always like, I mean, working with Bill Murray, I, I knew he was so great at improvisation, so I knew just throwing him in a situation, um, we'd be in a place with someone that didn't speak English, and then, you know, even with the photographer, I would like whisper something in his ear to the photographer, and then Bill would just react, so it was really fun working with 
um, you know, I can't remember, Anna Ferris was great, I loved working with her, and, and, and she, she, it was scripted, but then she could kind of go riff on it, so it, for me it was really fun to, um, you know, as a comedy fan to, to watch them and, and, and be able to throw things at them and they could react and come up with things that were surprising and funny, so I enjoyed that, but, um, You know, I try to be open and flexible, and things always happen on set that you don't expect, and then you and then you try to incorporate them. So I think that's that's the fun is that you don't know exactly what's going to happen, and and people bring things or accidents happen um, that that work. There's a, there's a dinner scene where I think they're just talking about the Colin Farrell character, and one of the little girls dropped her fork really loud, and that just happened by mistake. But I I loved it, so we kept doing it on every take because um, it just showed so much of how tense they are. That this man is come into their world, and so little things like that, I, you know, you, I think you just, um, I think you can only plan so much, and then it kind of comes to life when you're on set. I think we just have time for two more, so there's a gentleman here, and there's a woman in front of you, um, and then I think we're out of time, sorry. Uh, you talked at length about, like, the lessons your dad and your cinematic family has sort of imparted on you, but what are the things you had to, like, unlearn from them, or shy away from doing to sort of create your own style? Oh, that's a question. I never thought about that because I, I feel like I, I learned a lot just from being on set and um, and then things that you know my dad talked about. But when I set out to make my own film, it really came from what I was interested in and so different. And you know my my personality is so different. So I I um I just thought about doing it in my own way. And um and there's a story my dad came to set on my first movie and was saying like you need to say action louder they need to know you're in charge and <laughs> and, and uh, I was like well I th this is how I'm going to do you know so you have to find your own way of doing things so but I didn't ever feel intentionally I mean I would I would never make a, a gangster movie I just you know like I would never <laughs> I would never go on you know he's um, so as far as shying away I probably wouldn't yeah I wouldn't take on material that he's the great master of but I you know I always felt like I I was drawn I, I do <coughs> just try to do things um you know, when what interests me and, and how, how I relate to the world and how I would approach them. Here. Hi. Here. <laughs> My name is Celia and I'm from Barcelona. Um, the atmosphere of your movies is so beautiful and so specific. I was wondering if you ever had to create in any other media or convert any of your movies into any other media like paintings or songs or photography, what would it be? Oh, I, I wanted to be a painter. I went to art school and wanted to be a painter, and so, um, but I'm not good at it, so I would love to be a painter, but, um, but, uh, but I feel like I get to, you know, make images with, with film work and work with, um, you know, the, all the, the great team for the lighting and the cinematography, so, um, so it's hard for me to, to, to think about how, I, I enjoy doing kind of small projects in other mediums, and I like photography, but, um, but I, I feel like, Filmmaking is uh, the way I'm most able to express myself and, and what I'm thinking about, I guess. You seem so disappointed when I said we were done. And I know a lot of other people have questions too, but I'll give you the last one. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't come from like Condé Nast Traveler magazine, but I have a traveling question for you. <laughs> Being from Napa Valley, is there any place that you find magical or dreamy or a must-see, something that informed because you grew up there, something that informed your visual. About Napa Valley? Yeah. A pl oh. I wonder what you saw there, a place that I, someone shouldn't miss being there. Oh, Would it be it's outside? such a beautiful place. You're doing your honeymoon. Uh, Are you going I'm on your honeymoon to I'm Napa? going on my honeymoon, <laughs> but I really am thinking. <laughs> oh, on a large congratulations. Oh, no pressure now. <laughs> now you really gotta get something good. Gotta set up a wine tasting for you. There's a winery. Yeah. Plenty, um, I hear. <laughs> oh God, I, mine are more like, uh, yeah, I feel lucky to have grown up in Napa Valley, and um, I can't think of one place that you have to go, but I'm from St. Helena. That's a nice town to see. And there's a place on the way in called Gott's Roadside. It's a burger place that we always go to. It's not, I don't know if it's there for a honeymoon, but. Have a burger at Gott's <laughs> yeah. Roadside. Perfect. Yeah. There, there you go. go. Have Thank a great you honeymoon. So um, <laughs> you guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much. Thank Sophia. you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>
And the film, the film opens this week. Check it out. Congratulations. Thank you again, Sofia Coppola.